Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, you can see that uh, we didn't exactly plan out our 10-minute talks too well, but we'll manage to finish on time for lunch. Um, so first of all, thanks to the committee for inviting me and, and uh, uh, to come down and talk. Uh, it's always a problem, and I don't think minimally invasive surgery would have gotten off if the types of results that Doug and, and, and Mark presented were uniform across the country because they're so outstanding that it's hard to compete. I don't care if you're doing a minimally invasive or not because those are just tremendous results. Uh, by way of disclosure, uh, if it was 15 years ago, I'd have to account for some $20 million in industry money. But today, there isn't any left. I can't tell you where the other $19 million went that didn't get spent on research, but it, it may be in an offshore account somewhere. Um, but today, literally, we have zero disclosure. So there is nothing to disclose in Pittsburgh. Um, the, uh, I would like to go on to the, this is the slide, I think. Yeah, great. Um, and I would like to also comment about, uh, about uh, uh, Doug Matisse's uh, residents coming down and, and uh, sharing time with us. Uh, incredible results. And uh, it's clearly at a point where I think the best compliment to the teacher is when, when the, the student becomes a teacher. And that's clearly the case with some of your guys because I could probably go up and learn a few things because we don't have a zero leak rate, uh, but, although it's low. And I think we're getting better in, in, uh, uh, every day, hopefully. So some of the essentials have already been covered. Uh, basically, it starts in the abdomen, obviously. And, and some of the things I've learned along the way are clearly uh, Mark Oranger insisting that you not touch that, uh, that uh, gastric conduit or whole stomach as you prepare it so you don't start with a beat up uh, a stomach. So that's very important. Although we do go to a little more narrow tube, uh, and I think you can get burned on that, clearly, if you go too narrow. Uh, but we've managed to uh, uh, go narrow, and, and I think we've reached a happy medium of somewhere around three to four centimeters in terms of the diameter. Uh, we've also learned along the way from uh, lots of people, but I was invited up to MGH to give a talk and met Earl Wilkins, and he impressed upon me in a couple of discussions and a dinner that elemental flap may be the key that people are forgetting. And uh, so we started using that elemental flap a few years ago after that talk, so I have to give him credit for that. And uh, I think it's helped us save some leaks. And also, when we do get a leak, I think it tends to help and, and uh, maybe avoid surgery and allow it to get to the drain and still heal. So I, I think that's important. Uh, the mobilization, clearly you can't do a, something under tension. And if you bring it up on tension, I think you're in, you're in trouble. And that may be pretty basic stuff. but. I think the retrogastric and interpyloric attachments are, are, are clearly have to be mobilized. Whether you do a full coker or not, I think it depends on if that pylorus is ready to lift up and touch the right cruise easily, then I think you're done and move on to the next step. Um, how you and where you do the anastomosis, I think, are important to me uh, based on where the tumor is. And over the years, uh, especially as I was getting started in Pittsburgh, I noticed that in the first protocol we had, 24 of the 25 were adenos at the GE junction. So we began to question, do we need to be in the neck? And if not, uh, could we do a good job in the chest with the anastomosis? So I think that's very important starting out with your tumor. Is it extending onto the, onto the stomach? Do you have Barrett's that's going up high? If you do, you may not be able to do uh, an Ira Lewis. You may need to go to the neck, but, but by and large, the tumors I see today, even with some extensive Barrett's, were okay with an Ivor Lewis because we can get quite high. Um, the Ivor Lewis has some clear advantages that I noticed right away thoracoscopically, and maybe that was from the exposure I've had to thoracoscopy along the way. The view was just phenomenal. Uh, the medical students standing in the conference room could watch uh, and get a very good idea of exactly what you're doing, what are the issues. And for the neck, I always felt everybody kind of huddled over trying to see, and if we were given a course, we could never give a very good view of the neck even when we use the overhead camera. So it's clear that the visualization is better for teaching. Uh, certainly in the chest, we need less gastric tube length so that you can trim some off if you need to. And maybe if you're not so skilled at mobilizing, you'll get away with, with a little less length. Um, certainly allows more latitude in obtaining that negative gastric margin. Uh, I like the uh, thoracoscopic view for the node uh, dissection as well. And I think there's less aspiration uh, from trauma in the neck. Not all of us are going to be as skilled as Mark Oranger in that neck. I, I agree with every point he made. 
The problem is that we don't have very many people that have done 3,000 or taught 3,000 or supervised 3,000. So I think there's still a lot of trauma that takes place by the average thoracic surgeon for lots of reasons. And uh, uh, some of the technical reasons are the product that's being sent to us, one out of, out of general surgery, clearly the amount of neck surgery in the average general surgery residence training is well under 5%, especially at the senior level, maybe zero at the senior level these days in their PGY-4 and five years. Uh, so, and then our requirement for thoracic neck work is essentially zero. Uh, so there's more and more chest and abdominal experience that comes out of their training. So when they come to us, I think basically their neck skills are pretty marginal. Uh, there may be exceptions to that, but I'm just saying what I see in my own thoracic residents coming to Pittsburgh, and, and we don't give them a heck of a lot of neck experience outside of a few cases. And there's serious consequences to not being experienced in the neck. Uh, and we've hit on some of those already, so I'll move on a little bit. Um, this is uh, just a view of our, if you could play that for me, Frank, that'd be great. This is a view of how we prepare the conduit. And even this one, I'm gonna criticize a little bit, uh, even though we did it, uh, uh, I think, Today, we wouldn't even put this grasper here. So we would actually grab at the very tip of the stomach, even on the very early uh, uh, grasp, to avoid traumatizing this. And I think you'll see at the end, the tube's gonna be pretty uh, healthy looking, atraumatic, hopefully as healthy as Mark's looked. And we will grab a little bit down by the antrum to give a little bit of counter traction. I think it helps you lengthen that conduit as you staple. Uh, but clearly we're going out here today, this grasper wouldn't be allowed. That's a get up there, get on up there higher, there you go. So we don't mind that. We'll get way up at the tip grabbing because we're gonna trim that off after we do that uh, side of stomach uh, uh, exit with the uh, EEA. So we're gonna continue on up here, again, being very careful how we handle the conduit. And again, on the tip, we'll grab, pull it up and get that length. And we really look at where we're laying the staple line as being completely parallel to the arcade over here so that we never uh, uh, get that zigzag look to our conduit. And that's a pretty, pretty nice looking conduit and you can do a lot with that in terms of where you want to go for the anastomosis, whether you're going to the neck or the chest. Um, so some of the considerations for the EEA, um, certainly we prefer the 28. I think the 25, uh, especially in the chest, is going to lead to a higher level of stricture. That's what we've seen. 28, we get away with uh, not very many uh, recalcitrant strictures. I don't think it's that uncommon to have to do a dilation or two early on in the, uh, uh, the um, uh, perioperative period, maybe in that first three to six months, but generally we have a pretty good success rate with the 28. Uh, we like to do the anastomosis relatively high towards the inlet. I think there's less bile reflux, better margins, and uh, just an overall better functional result. Uh, lots of issues of bringing that conduit up. You have to maintain the orientation. As soon as it comes out of the hiatus, you have to have an eye on that staple line, and we, st we attach it to the gastric conduit very carefully, very consistently, so we know as we pull it up exactly where it is. It's not a time to be talking or teaching. It's a time to be paying attention to exactly how you pull that orientation, because once it's twisted, especially if it's twisted 180, you're not sure which way to go back and forth, and you can get very confused early on, although I'd say today that's become very routine. Uh, and then we don't want to avoid excess conduit. Bringing that up, it's a little difficult thoracoscopically to tuck it back down. And I've seen many films over the years post-op that have that sort of shelf, uh, almost like a man-made achalasia sigmoid loop, uh, which I think is the worst possible thing you can do when you bring up an aperistaltic conduit. Um, so uh, once we get that uh, proximal esophagus identified where we want to cut it, we want to mobilize a few more centimeters up. We don't want that posterior wall of the esophagus to be tethered by those attachments. If you put that anvil in and just a tiny bit of lift and it's tethered, you will rip out the back wall, or at least there's a potential for that. So you got to be careful there. And then we make a, about a four to five centimeter incision somewhere around the sixth or seventh intercostal space at that posterior axillary line. And that allows us to put the anvil in. Of course, no rib spreading. We do use a little plastic wound protector because of the really because of the soilage of putting that anvil into the stomach and there's frequently lots of saliva and other things. And we had a few infections right there at that uh, little incision. And I think it was from putting the EA into a relatively dirty uh, uh, stomach. 
So uh, a few tricks for getting that anvil in, we generally just grab the sides with a couple of snowdens, but occasionally when it's a little tight and we want to get that 28 in, we'll use a 30cc Foley balloon, put it inside the esophagus and gently dilate it, very gently. If you're too aggressive, you're going to rip the mucosa uh, and you may need to downsize to a 25. I'd say maybe one out of 25 will go to a 25 millimeter. But most of the time with a little gentle dilation, we can get that uh, mobilized and use the 28. Um, we then, after that's, uh, after we've decided on that, we drop the anvil in, put it inside the esophagus, and we'll use two purse string sutures uh, sewn generally with the endo stitch. And the first one is just basically a baseball stitch to get it grasped and get the thing in there. Because uh, it is a little trick to have it pop out in, but the second stitch is fairly precise. And we want to stay close to the end, just like your staples are close to the end on the auto purse stringer. You really don't want to have a big flowering of esophagus uh, that's going to maybe make your stapler uh, a bunch of excessive tissue. So we avoid that. Uh, this is kind of what it should look like after you've, get it, uh, after you've got it sewn in. And then we're ready to come through the side with the stomach. And then we'll staple it off. And uh, let's move on just to, to say that I don't, I, I'm going to mention this. Uh, I think if you're having trouble sewing in the anvil and you, you really want to try something that might be easier, I know this has been discussed today, John pointed out in the neck. In the neck it's a lot easier to use because you can grab it and dock it manually. This thing is not easy to grab and I know there are a few uh, 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 commercial manufacturers where you can grab a docking device and hold on to it. Even then I find it hard to dock the thing, so I'm not a big fan of this but it has helped some individuals, I'm told, uh, in terms of getting it done. Uh, can we run this video? Uh, so this is after you've identified where you want to cut and you uh, come basically, on this particular anastomosis, we would come straight across the esophagus at a right angle because we're not looking to, to do that little hood thing that Mark does when he's uh, sewing them in. Uh, and I understand what he's talking about there. This is where it gets a little tricky. It can pop out on you if it's tight. Uh, so once you get it in there, you then just baseball stitch around it to get it uh, held in and then we're going to follow that with a, a pretty precise suture uh, again just to uh, 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 make sure that we're not going to have uh, any problems with the rings uh, later on. And you can see it's been well mobilized posterior so we can lift that up just gently uh, on the posterior side of the esophagus so we don't have any trouble with, uh, with lifting it and sewing it. Then we'll go ahead and open the tip up, uh, up where most of the trauma should have occurred when you're grasping it. And we'll open that up and then just slide the uh, uh, EEA through our little four to five centimeter incision. We'll enter the uh, stomach. And now after you're in, you, you decide how much you want to get rid of. If your length is fine on the tube, you didn't have an issue with gastric margin, your esophagus margin was good, you really, we're going to go near the inlet every time, above the azagus. And we'll go ahead and pop that in and then so, uh, cut off the tip. Typically, we're removing six to eight centimeters of what we would refer to as the potentially ischemic tip. And there's a nice straight tube, which is what we like to see. After this is where we would leave, and particularly avoiding a shelf at the, at the base there. That's very important. Uh, we almost use that EEA to gently pull that uh, gastric conduit up rather than bring in a lot of excess, fire the staple, and then you're looking at a, a large amount of stomach in the chest. Uh, now, after that, uh, the omental flap, and I've told you that I, I really got uh, excited about this after talking to Earl Wilkins uh, because of his reputation there amongst the residents and some of the attendings that he never had a leak. When I asked Dr. Wilkins that, he said, hey, Jim, I never said I never had a leak. I'm sure there were some. There weren't many, but I'm sure there were some. But nevertheless, I think the omentum is one thing that may help you besides all the other issues we talked about that day. So I started doing it, especially after chemo RT. I wouldn't say I'd do it in every single case, but the chemo RT cases, everyone get it. And I think it's added to our, uh, to our technique. And there you can see we just save a few arcades and go along the uh, greater curve and preserve those. It's a bit of work in an obese patient, that's for sure. Uh, then we lay a drain in uh, after the omental flap's been folded over it. And I'm just going to kind of close down here, except to say that the biggest difference we noted is that our our leak rate was, was pretty favorable and, and only 3% were requiring any surgery at all and that was generally a VATS to clean it up and reposition the drain in most cases. Uh, vocal cord paresis quote, uh, slash paralysis 
went from 8% when we went to the neck down to 1% and essentially should be zero. So those were some important points when we went from the neck anastomosis to the Ivor Lewis uh, EEA. Um, I think I'll just conclude here. Uh, cervical anastomosis, we heard a lot about. I think it can be absolutely outstanding results in, in good experienced hands, but less experience, lots of problems. Not so easy to teach with our uh, crop of residents today coming out because of, I think, less experience in the neck. Intrathoracic Ivor Lewis, uh, all the things we talked about, a little less length needed, less tension, ability to trim off an ischemic tip, which I think is important, a near zero recurrent nerve injury, better gastric margin in an era of GE junction tumors, uh, of course. Uh, I think it's easier to teach. I can take my junior residents through it. I took my I6 intern. Both of them have gone through one when they were doing their month on my service, nearly uh, skin to skin on that anastomosis. Uh, omental flaps may be a valuable step. They have been good for me and less than half of the six that develop a small leak have needed any kind of intervention, and when it is, we do an early VATS. So either approach can be careful with attention to fundamental principles, and, uh, and I'll close with that, except to say that those of you who saw the kids running around last night, they ultimately do tire out, and we can fatigue them at some point, but it takes a lot of work. Uh, thank you very much.